You ready, mate? I'm ready. Let's Excited. Do it. Hello and welcome to episode 52 of Great Things with Great Tech, the podcast highlighting companies doing great things with great technology. My name's Anthony Spiteri and in this episode, we're talking to a company who develops a cost monitoring platform to help companies manage their Kubernetes resources and costs, providing direct integrations with the Kubernetes API and other billing APIs in the cloud all to help clients reduce spend and pre prevent resource-based outages. They're currently sitting on a tick over $35 million in total seed plus Series A funding. That company is KubeCost, and I'm talking to Webb Brown, the co-founder and CEO at KubeCost. Welcome to the show, Webb. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks for the great introduction, and yeah, pumped to get into it today. Excited no worries. Yeah. Excellent. I might have prepared that earlier. So there you go. It's good when those always come off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hey, mate, just before we get into everything about, you know, Kubernetes and, and cost pressures and whatnot, um, I just want to put a shout out to the show. If you like great things with great tech and would like to feature in future episodes, you can click on the link on the show notes or head to gtwgt.com. All the episodes are up on the website. You can also obviously listen to this on YouTube or go to any podcasting platform, all distributed and hosted by anchor.fm. All right, um, Webb, let's get straight into it because I feel like we're going to run out of time really quickly. We've got so much to cover around, you know, what KubeCost is all about around the Kubernetes costing and whatnot. Let's just start off by going through the history, a company that you founded uh, with uh, RJ Tripathi back in 2019. Maybe just go back, a bit of background about yourself, but also what kind of got you guys to start this company? Yeah, um, we'll, we'll take it back to the beginning. Um, Jay and I like to say that Jay and I, in my views, I don't know if he agrees, but I very much feel this way, was very lucky to sit right next to Jay uh, when I joined Google. Wow. Um, we joined within a, a month of each other uh, in, in 2013. And it was not soon after that that we started talking about the idea of, of building stuff together. Um, Jay was an infrastructure engineer. I was a product manager. Right. Um, we just you know, pretty quickly started uh, talking about our love of, of creating and, and building new things. Um, we were in a group where we were working on various like infrastructure monitoring uh, like problems yep. um, in like kind of you know, core like you know, Google infrastructure applications. Jay went on to Google Cloud. I went on to like a dev tools team after about a year and a half on a team together. Um, and we were in this really cool spot where we saw some of our teammates join the Kubernetes effort really early on. Uh, and what we quickly saw was that early users of Kubernetes, especially those at scale, uh, were having real challenges, even just getting basic visibility into spend, yeah. right? This old model of... Um, you know, tagging VMs or tagging machines and allocating them back or, you know, you know, like charging them back to a particular department or team or project, et cetera, just, just really didn't work anymore. No. Uh, because like in Kubernetes world, most things are multi-tenant, right? Like the Kubernetes scheduler is what is making these really complex decisions on where things run at any given time. Uh, so we felt, yeah, compelled to go and launch the, the KubeCost open source project uh, in, in 2019 and um, kind of the, you know, the rest is history. It's yeah. been an amazing adventure and you know, now have you know, more than 5,000 teams running the product across wow. a lot of different environments. Isn't it awesome um, how, you know, like for you, it literally just became a case of you sat next to the right person, like when you started. Um, that's the first sort of tick, right? Um, I listened to another podcast that talks about history turning on knife points, right? And it's kind of it's that sort of thing with you sitting next to RJ. But also you guys were really there at the start of what, of Kubernetes effectively, right? Like before it was really a thing and it, the project was, I guess, started inside Google. It, it's really cool that you guys were there and straight away you saw that problem that needed to be solved. And I think you're absolutely right. The, the whole way in which Kubernetes overlays the old way, well, I won't say the old way because I still love the old way. The virtualization, the VMs, the, the, the you know the actual machines, it's just so much harder to allocate cost because there's a lot more of a, a shared model with it, the microservice architecture, 
the way that you know resources are spun up and down dynamically the way that you're relying on external you know resources as well it could be a public cloud it could be internal you're right there's a massive problem there um interestingly enough i'm just interested in your take before we dive into the open source side of things first before we get into the kubecos side which is obviously related you know what's your take currently on the adoption of kubernetes because to a certain extent it's still kind of in this state of immaturity there's complexity kubernetes at scale is still hard so where do you see it today versus when you look to start this you know even what eight years ago now yeah um so when we even just go back to the beginning of our company i remember in our early kind of slides if you will it was what is kubernetes yeah. um and then you know the qu question of like was will will kubernetes be a thing right there's a lot of different you know platforms to run uh like containers um or, or orchestrate containers uh and so it is mind-blowing how far we've come as an ecosystem in terms of moving workloads and scheduling workloads in productions uh, in production environments on Kubernetes. Um, I like to say that it, it feels like we're in say, you know, any number three, you know, any, any number two or three, which is like, you know, we're not just starting, like we see every day, like massive production Kubernetes deployments mm -hmm. across basically every single vertical. Um, I was going to ask you know, the verticals and where you see it. Yeah. Because I think for my, I think, uh, yeah, go ahead. But I, I've got a bit of a, outlook on that but yeah what's your thoughts there on the verticals i would say in general it is much broader than i anticipated at this point in the like evolution of of kubernetes yeah um i would have thought that um you know we would have saw seen like a a very heavy concentration and kind of um you know tech companies you know like you know like growth stage companies that were like on the bleeding edge yeah you know in our user base we have everything from like luxury retail to auto manufacturers to you know massive banks to healthcare you name it and i feel like we've seen it at this point so it is much broader and, and i think it's just representative of adoption of, of kubernetes right like we just see enterprises of all scales and all types all industries adopting yeah and i guess when they're coming to you they're using it more than just in a in a dev sense or a staging sense right because, or you know just on a laptop because at that point, if they're coming to you to solve the problem, which is cost, then there's something tangible attached to that. It means there is an application, there is a workload that they are, they do care about that is costing money, but then important to the business. But then how do they control that cost as well? So I think it just depends on who you talk to. And obviously you you guys are at the coal face because you know there is that need for it. And your 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 problem statement, I guess, is you know, trying to resolve that overspend and cost issue within that ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a great point. Like, and it's interesting even to see the evolution where we see this shifting early and earlier, which is, you know, go two years ago and it was pretty much 100% of teams that were coming to us had production workloads or were really close to production workloads in Kubernetes. Increasingly, we see platform engineering or, or DevOps teams that have kind of been there, done that, like seen some of the pain point of just having no visibility and, and the cost impact it can have. And they're pulling this for as like a core requirement before they stand up a platform. Yeah. Um, so it's been interesting to see that, you know, evolution happen. Um, and, and we view that as just more and more awareness of the problem and, and you know, having um, a cohort of, you know, like great engineering groups that have lived this uh, kind of pain point before. Yeah, yeah. I guess just before, I've got a, a good question to ask. But before that, I guess just from a point of view of, you know, how, what, what Kube cost is effectively, because I guess we haven't really, you know, laid that out for some of the listeners. Like, what is Kube cost? What it's trying, trying to achieve? How does it relate to um, the open cost as well in your CNCF open source world? Um, and then I've got a, couple, a follow up question we'll go back to after that. So let's go in reverse a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, uh, great questions. Um, for a lot of users, and I think of them like when we like meet at KubeCon, a lot of them see our name and they're like, let me guess what you do. Yeah, I was going to make a joke. I was going to make a joke. We talked about joking about, you know, usually I ask people about the name and how you came to it, but it's bla blazingly obvious. So yeah, <laughs> we won't go down that case, path. <laughs> yeah, it reflects that we are a, a transparent team um, and, you know, like pretty literal with our naming uh, so we build, you know, cost management uh, platform for teams running cloud native or, or Kubernetes. 
Um, so what we do is kind of three parts. We give teams great visibility into their spend on Kubernetes and then related services. So if you're using say like external services like S3 or RDS, et cetera, from a Kubernetes tenant. Uh, and then we give insights into how to optimize infrastructure and like applications on top of it. So the goal here would be to help each, you know, like organization or team find the right balance between cost and reliability or cost and performance. Yeah. And then lastly, we give teams kind of governance solutions. Um, you can think like uh, budgets and policies and, you know, spend alerts, um, all these things available in real time um, to help team just kind of put some guardrails on, um, you know, spend and, you know, spend over time as their infrastructure and, you know, platform evolves and, and changes. Yeah. And just in terms of the, I'm interested in, in the, in the actual teams, like you're using teams a lot. So what's your, what's your definition of a team? I'm just interested in that. Yeah. Um, it can, it can vary, but we are typically working with like a, a platform or DevOps team yep. that is like managing that infrastructure, that Kubernetes infrastructure, whether it's like, you know, on-prem, you know, KubeCost runs on-prem, even like in air-gapped environments or a manage, you know, like, EKS, AKS, GKE, et cetera. Um, yeah. So we would typically view them as like, uh, they're our core group that we typically start working with. Often from there, they'll share this data or insights with finance or application engineering or, you know, like executive management teams. Um, so other teams will get brought in, uh, but it's oftentimes that core like DevOps team that we we typically find will install KubeCost or OpenCost yeah, first. Because they're the ones that typically are the ones that will blow out spend traditionally and kind of do their own thing. Uh, the, the dev that I've obviously working in service providers working within platforms and working with developers almost all my career. I know how gung ho they can be at times, right? Um, and to them, cost isn't front of mind, you know, never is um, because they just want to get the application out. They want to write it where they want to write it, put it where they want to put it, consume what they consume. So you're, and that, that kind of led, lends itself to the patterns of overspend. Like we've, uh, I've seen you talk about this before, which I thought was a really interesting, you know, tie into Kube costs and what you guys see, because you, you're kind of defining five patterns of overspend being orphaned resources, abandoned workloads, rogue deployments, which is kind of what I was talking about, the rogue developer doing what they want to do, um, leveraging incorrect usage types and over-provisioning. Actually, when I see all of these, I just blame the developer. Um, overall for them not understanding as an infrastructure platform guy I, I kind of you know it irks me a bit but this is what we're doing we're trying to kind of make them aware of where their spend is and crib cost is, is putting that front and center like you said making them aware first and then literally getting that information to the people that are making the decisions you know above them in terms of the operators and owners yeah so at, like as an engineer or you know, former engineer myself um, I know that as an engineering team you've got a million things to think about, right? And yeah. and we view it, you know, just like you mentioned first, which is like first and foremost, it's about you know shipping products and making sure they're reliable and doing things um, to like you know create value for for your users and you know your your company, etc. Um, our view is that we just want to try to reduce the friction and make it you know that much more accessible to say what does this application cost. You know, and and is that the right balance between you know excess capacity or slack capacity and the costs associated with it versus you know the risk of saying having you know too little capacity and then you know having performance degradation um, you know or or, or outages yeah. potentially. Um, so we just view it as like we're you know there to create that visibility uh, as step one, and we think that's like a critical critical step to actually getting to like efficient or optimized infrastructure. Um, you know, there, if there's one metric that we recommend teams start with to like on their journey to like optimize infrastructure is a notion of cost efficiency. Mm -hmm. So essentially of every dollar that you're spending on your environment, um, where that's like, um, you know, paying a cloud provider or, you know, amortization on like an on-prem, you know, infrastructure, what, what percentage of that dollar are you actually utilizing, right? So like any given point, like, um, you know, a dollar of RAM, you know, what are you utilizing? Uh, a CPU core, a yep. GPU core, disk, et cetera, et cetera. If you just roll that up into one number for a cluster, it can be like incredibly uh, telling 
um, at a very high level. And then from there, you can dig into, like you said, is this, I can go and uh, like optimize application level you know, things. I can optimize things at the orchestration level. I can optimize things at the infrastructure level, like node size, you know, instance type, like, you know, the way node pools are allocated, scale up, scale down, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So I think in total, we've got 16 uh, different insights in our, our product today, touching on just what, you know, you mentioned and, and more, but we always try to help teams get great visibility first, Yep. because we oftentimes see that as a first step of just um, transparency throughout the organization and, and ultimately like some level of ownership to say that when cost goes up, teams are aware of it and, you know, and, and like increasingly it's on their radar and they can, they can take action. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've 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 installed and played with it, like I said, and even f I installed it on my little server that's sitting right next to me here, just on my little cube cluster that I've got, right? And it awesome. gave me some really interesting insights. And just I, I love looking. I've always I've always loved the capacity planning side of it. I used to manage a platform for that. This would have been awesome in, in that level. I always love those the graphs, trying to attach a cost to it. So that's my way of thinking. So I love seeing it. I know that developers traditionally don't see it that way which is why you get these this this almost i won't say it's a um it's it's a lack of understanding but they, like you said they're all about just getting the application that's their primary task you know how can i deliver this application i don't really care if i've left an ip address sitting there you know and reused one the elastic ip is still there it's going to cost two dollars a month who cares you know put that over five years times that by 10 that's quite a, you know it all adds up right so how do you think it's because I always think that this was always a, a thing, even back in the day, you know, if, if you're running a cloud platform on premises, you had to understand costs and it was generally driven down to CPU memory storage networking. Um, you're obviously going in a lot more granular, aren't you? And in, in today's public cloud world, like you said, you've got what, 15, 16 metrics there that help, you know, monitor the costs. Is it just something that's naturally evolved over time because of what we're seeing or is it just same, same? Yeah, I think the um, with the transition to distributed computing and containers, like infrastructure and applications are are getting more complex, right? So fundamentally, we believe you know new tools are needed and new like visibility and new insights are required. Um, but if you look at a lot of the like core principles of um, yeah, you want you know if if a team is significant spending significant amount of resources, you generally want them to be aware of what they're spending, yeah. right? And you know some level of accountability may be a good thing, right? Generally having like governance solutions to where if they expect to send a certain amount and they end up spending, you know, 5x that, they should ideally be aware, you know, really quickly. Um I think a lot of those core concepts are the same, but the abstractions we're using like Kubernetes auto scaling, you know, the actual like implementation using Helm, where you can take our product and, you know, install it, you know, in, in seconds, like all those we view are, are being rethought, yeah. uh, you know, with the like mass adoption of, of Kubernetes and distributed computing more broadly. Yeah. And actually, to be fair, like when you talk about the ease of install, like Helm, just cut one, one sort of command line and installs it within a couple of minutes, deploys all the, all the microservices, the pods and gets it up and running. That's kind of almost part of the part of the problem with Kubernetes as well is that you can just install stuff so easy. Like literally, and, and you don't know what's like, unless you've got an understanding of what's being deployed in the microservices, what's this pod doing, you know, what what other um, you know, elements is it using, is it using any security, is it using an, an, a load balance IP address. So I feel like there's a lot of just, let's just install it because we can get it off Google copy paste, you know, and, and we're doing it. Um, I think that's part of the problem that we're trying to solve here with cost and overspend because yeah, these resources can be consumed at scale. And, you know, you, like, you know, uh, if you look at the the cost, I think I looked at it last night, the cost of running an EKS cluster, you know, in theory over a year, if you kind of let it going, it's, it's, it ain't cheap. Like we're talking tens of thousands of dollars per year for a basic cluster. So if you just let that, per around the background, you're going to have to answer at some point to somebody who goes, hey, this bill is uh, not looking great. How do we solve it? Yeah. Yeah. Again, I think this all kind of starts with that just awareness, right? And and I do think that you've seen just such massive growth of the cloud as well as Kubernetes and also just kind of changing 
macroeconomic environment, if you will, where all of a sudden a lot of teams are saying, wow, you know, we're spending a significant amount here and we just want to be aware and, and get our arms around what we're spending. Um, and what, you know, what you typically see here is when teams are lacking visibility, the answer is, well, you just over provision, right? Because let's say you don't know if you need, you know, one CPU or two CPUs for an application. Well, you just get five because you don't want to be CPU throttled, yeah. right? And, and, you know, if you don't know the cost of those CPUs and you're not sure if that's another, you know, hundred dollars a year or $10,000 a year, it's easy to just do, you know, like do the over provisioning. Yeah. But once you have that visibility and the insights to allow you to kind of dial that in more effectively, and you can weigh the the probability risk of CPU throttling versus the actual dollar cost, it empowers teams to make those decisions much more thoughtfully, right? And and again, maybe when you're early to Kubernetes, it's okay to run really inefficiently because it costs your organization an extra say two thousand dollars, and you know global expenses for your company are. Ten billion dollars, yeah, right? Yeah, and so it, you know, it may, um, you know, it, it it will ultimately empower teams to take the actions that are right for them at their stage of adoption and and journey, you know, to to like you know being fully production Kubernetes. Yeah, and I had a I had a flashback as you were talking about the reality of you know the cost pressures today and just the change in metrics and the way that we've all become a lot better at understanding exactly what things cost. I, I had a thought back to when um, I moved data centers. This must have been, now I'm going back, right? Um, showing a little bit of my age, but about 2005, six, we moved to data, data centers. And I remember going into this new data center, we just stacked our racks. We had the power, but we didn't have power to the racks. So what I did literally, I, I lifted up the floor. I looked underneath and I just grabbed random power. Can you believe, like, can you believe it today, right? It wouldn't happen. I grabbed these random power cords, these three-phase cords and plugged it in and that was it and we had power. Because there was no notion of there was no notion of you know understanding that power costs money running these systems. They all run hot. If you produce heat, you're costing money, right? Like that's the whole yeah. point of CPU. And, and like if you're running these things hot, they cost money. But then obviously very quickly over time, 2005 to 2010, the reality was we had to start you know, understanding exactly how much these racks cost, you know, how much, if we were putting in a new rack of storage, you know, could we fit it within the, the kilowatt allowance in the rack? So this yeah. is, this is without question, an evolution of where we, what we did, but it's just doing it differently because now more people are consuming cloud in this way. The APIs and microservices, it's, it's just an evolution. Um, and you're obviously feeling that spot. I just had that flashback. I don't know why. And I thought it just tied in nicely. And maybe the older people on, who are listening can understand that. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it is an evolution of that. And then once you have that visibility, how do you like really, you know, optimize this equation again against cost and, and performance? And I think actually what you just shared, Anthony, is like touches on what you mentioned earlier with, with open cost, which is open cost is this is now a CNCF project, fully open source project um, to bring this common language of cost to anybody else that wants to build on top of it. Yeah. Um, so the AWS team just launched a, a really cool integration on top of this, which actually integrates with KubeCost, which again is you know fully built on top of OpenCost. But what this is trying to do is create just a common spec, a common language across any environment to where you can say, here is the cost of a container. And once you have a cost of a container, then you can roll up and say the cost of a namespace or a label or set of labels or annotation or microservice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's it's different than, again, the, the like previous generation of like VM costing because the cloud providers themselves don't have an actual like source of truth per se. They have to look into the Kubernetes uh, scheduler, yeah. you know, like the kubelet to actually see, okay, what is this container or this microservice actually consuming? And which set of nodes is it consuming those resources on and what are the costs of resources on those nodes and kind of roll those up and you know, do it in a sense that's like really dynamic because these things are constantly changing in Kubernetes environments. Um, so again, I think it's really, like you said, it's an evolution of that same problem kind of done with open source in a way that's trying to create a, a common language or a standard across 
a very diverse group of, yeah. of Kubernetes environments. So let, let's talk about the open source side of it, the CNCF project, like you mentioned and touched on, because I, I noticed like looking through your history, 2009, the open source project launched um, that you were running. But then obviously in, in June 2022, open cost launched as well. So what's the differential there between what you were doing in 2019 versus what you've launched um, open cost at IO this year? Yeah, great question. Um, if you look at the original KubeCost open source project, it was just kind of this bare bones, basic, really basic cost visibility. It kind of plugged into Prometheus so you could get like time series data on, on cost, right? And you would query Prometheus, you can like, you know, use alert manager to like look at cost metrics. Um, now, if you look at open cost, um, it is this full like cost allocation engine to where you can build models up and say, give me cost by namespace over the last, you know, seven days, okay. cost by label, you know, app over the like last, you know, 90 days, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it ships with a basic UI that users can use. Um, all of that's available like outside of the box. So, you know, if you look at that evolution, we've taken the original KubeCost open source project, we've committed it to open cost. We've added a bunch of things, you know, since we originally launched it. Yep. And then we've also, with a great group of partners, including, um, you know, Red Hat and uh, GCP and AWS and a number of others, um, to build a true spec around that model. So that again, teams can see from the ground up how we've uh, thought about the methodology for actually calculating costs in in Kubernetes environments. Right. So and open cost to IO is 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 that project where you go to exactly, and then effectively you you install it. Um, it's got all the installation sort of instructions on that site, and then it's got. I'm assuming out of the box, it's like you've got it's got some basic you know modeling that you can do. How, how do you actually then? model it like what type of persona is is would be doing that modeling is is it is it easy to do i mean is, is it i mean you mentioned the basic ui how easy is it to basically you know mold and create those um additional modeling sources yeah for most teams you can get up and running in minutes and you know answer the the common questions of you know again cost by cluster cost by namespace cost by service cost by annotation uh cost by you know De deployment or staple set or job, like, you know, you name it. Um, and that is kind of like pre-canned out of the box. You can come in and configure that for different time windows. You can also do some more configuration of like, um, you know, if, if you have shared services, how you allocate those across team. If you have um, like idle costs, how you allocate that across team. Um, so this is all meant to like give you a bunch of functionality out of the box where you can, you know, do a, like run a bunch of powerful reports. If you then want to like do, you know, more powerful, like take this data and transform it in other ways. Um, everything is backed by an API yep. um, in the UI. So you can, you know, query these APIs, whether it's like allocation data or underlying assets data. Um, so yeah, the goal is to like, you know, kind of tackle the 90% the plus use cases out of the box with like, you know, a UI that's really easy to use. And then for more advanced use cases, there's these APIs where you can take it and you know do any number of things with it. Yeah, the smart people can get into it and start to do smart things <laughs> with the APIs. <laughs> um, and then, okay, that's really cool. So I think that's, I, I love, this is one thing about the open source and CNCF you know, landscape that I love. I mean, I looked at the, the foundation, it's grown like the actual um, website with all the projects there. It's crazy. And that actual site has become very functional. I love what they've done with it. And I had to do something because it used to like chug your computer when you used to load it up. And if you <laughs> ever tried to load the PDF, it would just take forever. Um, that aside, I, I think it's great that you've kind of, you've, you've kind of taken that open source, you know, path, but, but still been able to build kube costs on top of that, you know, building building on the basis of that multiple projects and then offer some commercialized incentives for people to run Kube cost, right? Because in terms of your, your planning structure, you've got you've got a free forever, um, which is a certain set of capabilities. And then you run a, a mid-tier um, and then you've got like a, a basically a, a higher tier. But maybe just explain how that works and where you see the majority of people starting and do they, do they go to the next tier and where do you see that going? Yeah, so we've got thousands and thousands of teams running either like pure open source or that that free tier. Um, and it's meant to be 
again, always free, uh, useful for teams that are smaller or even midsize, but don't have the complexity of say like a, a large enterprise where you have to do say RBAC or, you know, use SSO or SAML or, you know, any like complex uh, kind of like organizational needs like that. Um, so we've got, you know, tons of teams that, that run that. And then we have, you know, hundreds of teams that have upgraded to more like, you know, enterprise license where they do need those like, you know, more complex features. Yep. Um, that, that fits with our model is like, we want to build tools that are free and useful for like tens of thousands of teams. And for those small teams that want more support uh, or small number of teams, excuse me, of, that want support training, you know, those complex enterprise features because they have like, um, you know, multi-cloud or hybrid cloud or, or many different clusters across different regions. And they want to see it all in a single pane of glass. Um, we have those versions available. Um, and yeah, I think that just fits with our view on like starting with open source. Um, everything is kind of by default um, built for our free tier. And then it's only if it's like very compelling, really just for larger enterprises that we tend to move it to like our you know enterprise tier. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's allowed us to, again, you know, work with thousands and thousands of teams and, you know, help them on a problem or a problem space that we find absolutely fascinating. And it's yeah. felt like a, a dream come true. Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 just the funding alone would, would dictate the success and the interest there, right? Like, I think that's, that's always a good indication of where you're at if people are willing to invest in your idea and your, in your vision. So yeah, absolutely, you're doing the right thing. And then obviously at some point, yeah, there's, there's, there's commercial aspects to it. But if you keep yourself true at heart for the, the mission statement, that's actually so important because it means that you're, you're kind of there and you believe in what you're doing as opposed to just being in it for the sake of a outcome, basically, right? Totally, totally. Yeah, I mean, we say we're here to help people first and we, we, we very much hope to build a sustainable business um, so that we can help more and more people over time, but it starts with helping people. Excellent. Uh, and that's independent of, you know, being being paid uh, to help <laughs> which is very uh, good like let's like let's let's not mince words that, that's a good thing but you know there's um other things that, uh, that actually are important in this ecosystem as well yeah i mean and we think it just works well with this ecosystem more broadly like you know your mention of open costs because of the cncf ecosystem where it's it's generally been really easy to align with projects like prometheus and, and thanos and others and have ours like essentially be built on top of it. Um, that like openness and like, you know, common data standards and just general interoperability, we think is incredibly valuable for ultimately helping users solve problems end to end. Um, in enterprises where like, you know, you see a lot of different needs, right? Where data needs to live and data compliance needs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so we think that's just key to like, building great end-to-end -end solutions that work in the the modern enterprise yeah cool uh, i've got a few more things before we finish up a couple of minutes left but um i wanted to talk about the aws partnership that you kind of just really announced it's really cool really exciting it's in the, it's on the aws marketplace if you search there um you know it, it lists you know the fact that you can obviously tie in very closely with EKS and the out of cluster costs as well. So, you know, effectively monitor spend on S3, RDS, DynamoDB and whatnot. But there's more to it, isn't there? Like what, what's the additional benefit that those customers are getting if they buy it through the marketplace in the partnership with AWS? Yeah, um, and, and there's actually a couple of different parts to this. Um, uh, I would say the biggest one that we just launched, um, which we think is, is really, really exciting, which is, um, uh, cost monitoring for EKS. Um, and that is a partnership with the EKS team uh, where you can take a, a kind of EKS optimized version of KubeCost. You can deploy it on any KubeCost cluster, or sorry, any EKS cluster uh, for free, you know, within, you know, minutes, if not seconds. Um, that That is coming with like a Helm chart that's optimized for EKS. Cool. Again, it's coming with like, unlimited free capabilities across any EKS cluster. And then it's coming with support from the AWS team. So oh, you okay. a, wow. support lines with, with AWS. Um, so we're really excited by the partnership. Um, 
and you know feel like there's a lot more we can help to yeah get teams great visibility and insights on on the EKS platform. Yeah, and I guess that the other thing I wanted to highlight was again like I've installed it locally on my own cluster. You know, this is obviously my test dev, which which I muck around in, try and work out the crazy world of Kubernetes. Um, but then you know, there's other um, obviously people out there like we see the proliferation of OpenShift out there. So on-prem Kubernetes is obviously a real thing. So you, in your balance or the way that you kind of set up your the way that you look at future enhancements or versions. How do you balance that out, knowing that you know the world today is kind of hybrid, and a Kubernetes cluster is is as likely to be on prem moving forward as it is, you know, in the public cloud? Yeah, uh, it's a great point, um, and it speaks to like how we actually architect the, the product from day one. So, um, you know, Kube costs as well as open costs can run in any on prem Kubernetes cluster. Um, you know, from the last I think now close to three years or you know two and a half years. Um, so, uh, you know, it, you don't have to egress any data, you know, to any kind of like coop cost service or anything like that. Um, you can take it and again, Helm install it, whether it's like you use a storage bucket that's accessible locally in an air gapped environment, or just pull it from our repos. Um, so we wanted to architect for that day one to just have a fully self-managed deployed version, again, yeah. kind of like a Prometheus or Grafana to just let users own and control their own data and their own experience. If you look at our user base today, um, about 25% of it is estimated to be on-prem. Um, so it is- an, That's a, a big number. That's bigger that. than I would have thought, actually. There you go. Interesting. Same. same. And, and I think, um, you know, what, we, what we've seen anecdotally is that like a lot of users are onboarding to like EKS and managed platforms. And that number is generally going growing really quickly, but there's also just this massive footprint of like on-prem clusters um, that you know, and just like infrastructure in general that's yeah. out there and is you know still getting a lot of investments and is not going away anytime soon. Good point. Yeah, there you go. Hey, and the the final questions are kind of slightly controversial one, and I did prep you for this just just to make sure that it was okay to ask. Um, like, do you foresee a time? you know, in the future where this cost issue because of the complexity and the relative immaturity of Kubernetes public cloud ever goes away or is under control? Or are we always going to have this problem because of the nature of where distributed computing is going? Yeah, so it is, um, you know, it's our mission to to make it go away. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, with open cost and purely open source solutions, um, we want this to be, this data to be available to everybody. Right. Like just like we think about is like for most, um, you know, platforms getting, say, CPU utilization data is kind of not, not entirely, but like most uh, users think of it as a soft problem. Right. Like we think cost visibility or cost observability can go to a very similar place. Yeah. And that's what we're focused on doing. Um, we you know want to do everything we can to support teams to like build on top of open cost, integrate with open cost, et cetera. Um, we think we can do a lot more of the like training and again, building kind of enterprise guardrails and things on top of these metrics that we think are really important and will be really valuable for a long time to come. The reason we believe that is that we think that's an intersection of like technical complexity and just like organizational or behavioral complexity, yeah, right? right. Awesome. Um, and we think that like the intersection of that in large enterprises isn't necessarily going to be solved tomorrow. Um, but again, we want to do everything we can to solve that for everybody with Absolutely. these open source. Solutions. Fantastic. That's a great way to finish. We've got about 30 seconds left. So that's, that was really good. And I really wanted to ask that question. You, got, you guys are doing an amazing thing. You're obviously successful. You've hit that right problem statement. You've hit the market well. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys do in the future. So you know, thanks, Web, for being on. Um, just as a reminder, if you aren't subscribed or you're new to the show, please go to gtwgt.com. Um, hit the subscribe button. You can catch up on all future episodes. And with that, I'd like to thank Web and Kubecost, and we'll see you next time on Great Things with Great Tech. Thank you so much, Anthony. Perfect timing.